So where we are in our journey is, as you said, we are now in a posture of sujood. We are prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is a very key rukun here, pillar of the prayer, that should be discussed at this particular juncture. In fact, it should be discussed at any point of the salah. It's a rukun, a pillar, meaning in the absence of it, your salah could be rendered invalid. It's up there on the same level of someone who prays without wudu. And this is the rukun of tuma'nina. Tuma'nina literally meaning tranquility or composure, to pray with serenity, to not rush the salah, to give each position, each posture, it's, haq, it's, due, it's due, it's right. And in the famous hadith which Bukhari narrates and Muslim on the authority of Abu Hurairah, the hadith known as hadith al-musi'i li salatih, the hadith of he who prayed incorrectly. A man came into the masjid and he gave salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he took to a corner in Masjid al-Nabawi and he began to pray. When he finished his salah, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Irji' fa salli fa inna ka lam tusalli. Go back and repeat your prayer because you haven't prayed. So the man went back and he repeated his salah. And then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Irji' fa salli fa inna ka lam tusalli. Go and repeat your salah, you, you haven't prayed. And the man does this a third time and he hears the exact same commentary. You haven't prayed. And so this Sahabi, this companion is baffled. And he said, I swear by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, I don't know how to pray any better than this. So please teach me. And so he gave him instructions. Listen to the instructions bit by bit. He said to him, إِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَكَبِّرْ ثُمَّ اقْرَأْ مَا تَيَسَّرَ مَعَكَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ When you get up to pray, listen to the instruction. Imagine you are the one receiving this information. When you get up to pray, say Allahu Akbar, then recite whatever you can from Qur'an. He said, ثُمَّ ارْكَعْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ رَكِعَ Then bow till you find اطْمِئْنَان Meaning, till you find tranquility in your bowing. He said, Then stand back up till you find tranquility in your standing. Then prostrate till you find tranquility in your prostration. Then sit up till you find tranquility in your sitting, he said, Then repeat this for the duration of your salah. So the key word here is تطمئن, till you find tranquility. So this collides head on with the behavior of a lot of us when we pray, especially when we are in a rush. How we run through the motions of salah as if it's some sort of athletics competition, up, down, left, right, and there's no tranquility, there's no composure. The idea of standing till each one of your limbs and your joints finds its place of comfort and normality. Then bow and stay there until your limbs relax and your joints go back to their original position. Not to go up and down like the pl pl plucking of a rooster. And that was the description of the Prophet wasallam that he gave to the salah of the hypocrite. May Allah protect us from this description. He says, describing the prayer of a munafiq, a hypocrite, he said, قَامَ فَنَقَرَ كَنَقَرَاتِ الدِّيكِ لَا يَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ فِيهِنَّ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا He gets up, he prays hurriedly, plucking at his prayer as if he is a rooster and not remembering Allah Almighty in the salah except a little. Praying hurriedly and going up and down like the plucking of a rooster. So if you don't act upon this, my brother, my sister, your salah is under threat. Be careful. There is no rush when you are in salah. And that is why Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, radiallahu anhu, the companion, when he came across another man who was described as لا يتم ركوع الصلاة ولا سجودها, he wasn't perfecting the bowing and the prostrating. Hudayfa, radiallahu anhu, called him over. He asked him a question. He said, منذ كم وهذه صلاتك? How long have you been praying in this format? He said, منذ أربعين سنة. I've been praying like this for 40 years. 
Hudayfa said to him, Ma salayta mundu arba'ina sana. She said, Brother, you haven't been praying for 40 years. Wa law mutta. Wa hadihi salatuk la mutta ala ghayri al-fitrah. Thumma aqbala alayhi yuallimuhu. He said, My brother, if you were to die in this state, you would have died in a state that is contrary to the fitrah, to the natural way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Hudayfa radiallahu anhu went to the man and he began to educate him. So Hudayfa, he said to him, my brother, you haven't been praying for 40 years. And if you were to die in the state, you would have died upon a state that is other than the fitrah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And one of the key issues of this man's prayer is that he's not doing itma'nan, he's not finding tranquility in the prayer. He's bowing and instantly he's getting back up and then he's prostrating. Then he's instantly sitting and then no sooner does he raise his head, he's prostrating again. This may render the salah invalid. Be careful, my brother, my sister. And that is why Al-Bara ibn Azib, the companion, when he saw the salah of the Prophet وسلم, he had a very unique description of it. He said, رَمَقْتُ صَلَاةَ النَّبِيِّ I observed the prayer of the Prophet وسلم, He saw the following. He said, فَوَجَدْتُ قِيَامَهُ فَرُكُوعَهُ فَاعْتِدَالَهُ بَعْدَ الرُّكُوعِ فَسَجْدَتَهُ فَجَلْسَتَهُ فَسَجْدَتَهُ فَجَلْسَتَهُ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَنْصَرِفَ I saw the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ and I saw that his standing and his bowing, then his standing, then his prostrating, then his sitting, then his prostrating were similar in duration. So if you as Ibn Hajar, uh, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali and others have commented what this hadith means is that if the Prophet ﷺ wanted to prolong any aspect of the salah, he would prolong every other aspect of the salah. And if he shortened an aspect of the salah, he would shorten every aspect of the salah. So some of us, what we do, and inshallah there is no problem in doing this in principle, but it's not ideal. We're in sujood and it's a long sujood. But everything else of the salah is very short and rapid. The hadith suggests that if the Prophet ﷺ prolonged any aspect of his salah, he would prolong every other aspect. And if he shortened something, he would shorten every aspect of the salah. If you don't do this, it's not a huge issue. The key message here, however, is what? al itminan Don't be in a hurry when you bow, when you raise, when you prostrate. Give each position its due, my brother, my sister. So you are now in sujood, you're prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last week, if you remember, we introduced the enormity of this position. And we said this is the grand finale of salah. And we said that everything that we have done and studied up until this point was simply a preparation for this moment. To place your forehead, to press your nose onto the ground in submission to Allah Jalla Jalalu. In sujood, in prostration, our Prophet والسلام, would firmly place his palms onto the ground and his fingers would be facing the direction of the prayer, the Qibla. So he wouldn't do this, he would do this, assuming the Qibla is this way. And he would position his hands on the floor parallel to his head or parallel to his shoulder. There is a difference and all of this is acceptable insha'Allah. And he would prostrate pressing his forehead along with his nose on the ground. Some people, they will put their heads, but they will miss their nose. And other people, especially if they've done something nice with their hair, say before a wedding, he will place his nose onto the ground, but he will miss the forehead. Yes. What you should do, according to the majority of the scholars, is that you should pray, press your forehead along with your nose onto the ground when prostrating. And that is why Bukhari narrates on the authority of Ibn Abbas, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Umirtu an asjuda ala sab'ati a'zum. I have been instructed by Allah to prostrate upon seven parts of the body. What are the seven parts? He said, Al-jabha wa ashara ila anfihi wal yadayni wal rukbatayni wa atrafi al-qadamayni. He said the forehead and he pointed at his nose simultaneously. The hadith said, 
when he was enumerating the seven parts that he has to prostrate with, he said the forehead, and he simultaneously pointed at his nose. So the scholars have said the forehead and the nose, they are part of the face that should make contact with the ground when you prostrate. That's one. They are together. He said, and both of your hands, that's three, and both of your knees, that's five, and the tips of your feet, that's seven. So when you are prostrating, the Prophet Sallallahu way was to place his forehead and his nose onto the ground to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And he would also create a space between his thighs and his body, his abdomen. So when he is prostrating, he's not tucking his legs to his stomach as he prostrates, keeping it all together. Rather, he would create a space between his thighs and his abdomen when prostrating. And he would also create a second space. This is between his arms and his body. So he wouldn't prostrate with his shoulders tucked in like this. And of course, this could be the way if you are praying next to other people and you need to create space, that's fine. But in principle, he would create quite a significant space like this, almost, when prostrating, such that the whiteness of his blessed armpit could be seen when he prostrates, alayhi salatu wasalam. And such that if a small animal wanted to pass between his body and his arm, it could pass. So it must have been quite a significant space that he created when prostrating. And one thing that he would really discourage is the idea of resting your, forehead, your forearms onto the ground when prostrating like this. Some people, especially those who are perhaps new to the religion of Islam, when they begin to prostrate, they are like this, and they place their heads onto the ground, and their forearms are completely level with the floor. And the Prophet wasallam said that this shouldn't be our prostration. He said, لا يبسط أحدكم ذراعيه بصات الكلب في الصلاة لا يبسط أحدكم ذراعيه في الصلاة بصات الكلب You should not place your forearms onto the ground the same way that the dogs rest their paws onto the ground. So the idea of raising your elbows from the ground when prostrating and one of the wisdoms behind it and Allah knows best is to separate us from the behavior of animals who may resemble this type of position. Allah said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدم. We have honored the son of Adam. So we differentiate ourselves from all things that are lowly. We are to raise our elbows in prostration. And there in sujood, our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam would say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, three times. Meaning, how perfect is my Lord the Most High? You can say it once minimally, ideally you say it three, that is whole, or you may recite it as much as you want above that Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, depending on the khushu'a that Allah has blessed you with on that morning or that evening. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. And look at the paradox here, La ilaha illallah. How every one of the remembrances of salah has been carefully positioned with wisdom in that position of salah that will give you most growth and nourishment spiritually. So you are in sujood, at your very lowest point, where you drop your highest, your forehead, onto the lowest, the ground. And as you are in that low and humble state, you say, Allah Almighty is the most high. As if to say, I acknowledge I am the most low. And Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is Al-Ali, Al-A'la, the most high. So you say, Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la, glory be. Or how perfect is my Lord Allah, the Most High. A humbling reality, la ilaha illallah. And there in sujood is your opportunity to make your requests. The heavens now are unlocked for you. Think of all of the burdens, your needs, your anxieties, your worries, your requests, your desires. From this world or the hereafter. And send them up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the envoys of the malaika, the angels, through dua. As you prostrate. Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la. And there in prostration, there are other dua that we are recommended to say. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when you are in sujood, you should say the following Sahih Muslim. He would say, Allahumma ghfir li thambi kullah. Oh Allah, forgive all of my sins. Memorize it. The small ones and the huge ones. 
and the first of my sins, and the last of them. وَعَلَانِيَتَهُ وَسِرَّهُ And the public sins and the private ones. Forgive them all, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want a complete format of the hard drive. That is an ambitious dua. Don't leave a single one of my sins, O oh Allah, till you erase it. Now you may say to me, Brother Ali, what was the need for this type of elaboration? Surely it is enough to say, Allah maghfir li thambi Oh Allah, forgive all of my sins. Khalas, yakfi, this is enough. That covers the public and the private and the first and the last. Why the elaboration? And one of the wisdoms behind it, and Allah Almighty knows best, is because this is the nature of what happens when you are interacting with someone whom you love. When you share an intimate space with someone who is dear with you, you notice how you go on in intricate details, speaking for the sake of speaking. Why? Because you are enjoying the warmth of the intimacy of that moment. You've all experienced it with someone who is dear to you and someone whom you love, a gathering that you simply don't want to end. And that is similar to the Prophet of Allah, Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he is speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is hearing the voice of Ar-Rahman. And Allah Almighty asked him the question and Allah knows the answer. وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى What is this in your hand, O Musa? What are you carrying in your right hand? And Allah Almighty knows. What, is the, what was the response? What was the response of Prophet Musa? He said, هِيَ asai. It's my staff. It's my stick. He could have stopped there. Question, answer. He said, أَتَوَكَّعُ عَلَيْهَا I sometimes lean on it. وَأَهُشُّ بِهَا عَلَىٰ غَنَمِي And I beat the leaves of the trees so that I can feed my animals with it. And there it's almost as if he realized, as he enjoyed the warmth of speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he's going on in a little bit too much detail. So he said, wrapping, wrapping up and concludingly, وَلِيَ فِيهَا مَأَرِبُ أُخْرَىٰ I have other uses for the stick as well. As if to summarize. He just realized, I'm speaking to Allah Jalla Jalalu. And that's what happens when you're talking with someone whom you love. You don't want the conversation to end. So you speak and you give details and you elaborate. So here in the dua, you say, Oh Allah, forgive all of my sins. The small and the large. The first and the last. The public and the private. Such is the state of the mu'min, the believer, when he is beseeching Allah. So this is one of the dua that we are recommended to say when we are prostration. And I advise you to memorize the dua that is found in the Quran and in the Sunnah and also to spill out your heart and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then when you have finished your prostration, <coughs> you now say Allahu Akbar and you now sit up. This is your first sitting. The sitting that is found between or located between the two prostrations. You say Allahu Akbar and you sit up. And here the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam would sit on his left foot. He would lay it onto the ground and sit on his left foot. And using his right foot, he would keep his balance and he would keep his right foot erect and the toes would be pointing towards the qibla, curved and pointing towards the qibla. That's one way of sitting. Another way of sitting is to stand on your heels, or I mean to say to sit on your heels between the two prostrations. And to bend your toes such that they are facing or they are pointing towards the qibla as well. These are two ways of sitting between the prostrations. And here our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, what would he say? Huh? What dua would he say here? Rabbi ghfirli, Rabbi ghfirli, my Lord forgive me, my Lord forgive me. He's asking from the forgiveness of Allah. And subhanAllah, we've just come up from sujood, and sujood is a place of dua, requests. And now you are sitting up, and you're still making requests from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And such is the ambition of the believer in his Lord. You're asking a king who is rich, and whose stores never deplete, and who loves you more when you ask of him, unlike man who loves you less, the more you ask of him. So you're now sitting up, and you're saying, well, my Lord, forgive me. My Lord, forgive me. And when you say, Allahumma ghfir li, you're asking for maghfira, forgiveness. Maghfira is from the three original letters of the word, which is ghafara. Ghafara is a verb which means to cover and also to protect. These are the two meanings. 
to cover and also to protect. And that's why in the Arabic language the helmet which a, a fighter would wear on the battlefield is called in Arabic a mirfar, sharing the same roots. A mirfar, because a helmet has two functions. It covers your head. It covers your head. So you don't know what is beneath the head in terms of hair color, etc. It covers the head. And the second function of the helmet is that it protects you from the harm of battle. So you have a meaning of covering and a meaning of protection. So when you say, Allahumma ghfirli or Rabbi ghfirli, my Lord, forgive me, give me maghfira, you're essentially asking two of many things, which is, first of all, veil my sins. Don't disgrace me, don't embarrass me, don't make my weaknesses, O oh Allah, public. In this world, and don't make them, O oh Allah, public on the day of judgment. Cover me, veil me, don't humiliate me. That's one of the things you're requesting, and you're also asking Allah for protection. Save me from the evil consequences of sins that affects mental health, mental well-being, affects finances, affects relationships, affects your grave, affects your dying moments, affects everything. Give me protection from the consequences of sins as well. So he would get up from his prostration saying, Allahu Akbar. And he would say, Rabbighfirli, Rabbighfirli. There is a second dua, Allahu Akbar. It is so beautiful where he would make several consecutive requests between the two prostrations. He would say in this narration, memorize it. Allahumma ghfirli, O oh Allah forgive me. Warhamni and have mercy upon me. Wajburni and repair my breakage. Warfa'ani and raise my rank. Wahdini and guide me. Wa'afini and give me well-being. Warzuqni and provide for me. Allahu Akbar. Who is able to respond to these huge and colossal objectives and requests other than Allah al-Ghani, the most rich? SubhanAllah. So you have made this dua as you sit. Now you say Allahu Akbar and you go down for a second prostration. Notice you bowed once. There was one ruku' in your salah. In each unit of salah there is one ruku'. But there is two sajdas to show you the superiority of this position, of this posture, of this action, of this Unbelievable expression of humbleness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say Allahu Akbar and you go back down into sujood. As if to say, one sajda was not enough. One prostration has not satiated my need to be near Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. I need a second one for contentment. So you say Allahu Akbar and you go back down into prostration a second time. And here, after you finish your second sajda, you have essentially completed what? You've completed one full unit of salah. Each rak'ah or unit of salah looks like what we have just described. There is a takbir, there is a standing, there is a bowing, a raising, there is two prostrations. And now you have completed one full unit. And you repeat that twice for Salatul Fajr, four times for Dhuhr, Maghrib, or Isha, and uh, Asr, and three times for Salatul Maghrib. So notice, La ilaha illallah, how every rak'ah, every unit of salah, begins with what? The recitation of the Qur'an, and it ends with what? Sujood, prostration. Each rak'ah begins with the qira'ah, recitation of the Qur'an, and concludes with what? Sajda, prostration. Now look at the very first surah given to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is Surah Al-Alaq, Surah Al-Alaq. What is the very first verse? Iqra, recite. What is the very last verse? Kalla la tuti'hu wasjud, waqtarib, the instruction to prostrate. Surah Al-Alaq begins with the recitation of the Qur'an, the instruction, and, begins with the, and ends with the instruction to prostrate. And each rak'ah of salah begins with recitation of the Qur'an and it ends with, with sujood prostration. All of it has come from the same Lord, la ilaha illallah. The designer of it all is one. He is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-ahad. Now that you have finished your second prostration, you continue your salah, you repeat this process again till you get to your very first tashahud. The shahud is, of course, as you know, when you sit onto the ground 
and the Prophet وسلم, would place his left hand on his left knee or his thigh and he would place his right hand on his right knee or thigh and he would create a circle form like this grabbing onto his middle finger using his thumb and he would raise his index finger like this in the direction of the Qibla a single uh, expression of the unity of Allah, the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one form of others. And all of the four schools of thought, the Shafi'is, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, and the Hanafis are of the view that it is a sunnah, it is recommended to engage in ishara, to indicate with your index finger, like this in salah. Then there is a bit of a difference of opinion as per what you do with this indication, i.e., do you move the finger or not? This is a long discussion that we don't really need for this particular series. And alhamdulillah, there is scope to do more than one form as was understood by the scholars of Islam because there isn't a definite, a definite answer to this question. It's the interpretation of our Sunni scholars when looking at the hadith in this particular discussion. So for example, the Hanafis, they will say that the Sunnah here is you raise your finger just once when you say the negation, the nafi. When you say la, you raise it once, then you drop it. So at the hayatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat, assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salahin ashadu an la ilaha illallah. When you speak of the negation, there is no God, you raise your finger. When you say but Allah, you drop it. The Shafi'is, they say you raise your finger when there is the affirmation, the ithbat, you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. I testify that there is no God but Allah. When you are affirming but Allah, you raise your finger. This is their understanding. The Malikis, they have the opinion that you move your finger side by side like this. This is one of the understandings of the movement of the finger in Salah. One of the directions or one of the movements indicates the negation, the other one negates the affirmation, La ilaha illallah, like this. The Hanbalis, uh, in their madhab, it's the idea of raising your finger every time you utter the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lafdul jalala. So you have your hand dropped, every time you come across the name of Allah, you raise it. At tahiyyatu lillahi, wa salawatu wa tayyibatu, assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi. وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله. Every time you come across his divine name, you raise it. If this is confusing, don't be confused, and don't tell off your brother who is doing it in a different way to how you're doing it. And if you are really perplexed by this situation and you don't know what to do, just follow the way of your madhab, follow the way of your sheikh, your teacher. And if you don't have any of this to hand, you can simply keep your index finger raised for the entire duration of the tashahud like this. For the sake of simplicity, just keep your finger raised like this for the entirety of both of your tashahuds. And this is one of the opinions of our scholars, especially some of our contemporaries as well. So you are in tashahud. And Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was asked about the wisdom. What is the meaning of this raising of the index finger in your tashahud? And he, saw, he said, ذَلِكَ الْإِخْلَاسِ It is an indication of sincerity. It is an indication and an announcement of your tawheed. Unifying Allah Almighty in worship, he is one. And this is why it is so painful upon shaitan to see insan, to see the believer with his finger raised like this because it indicates the greatest of all realities, your Tawheed. And what can he do with that? And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the hadith which Ahmad narrates in his Musnad, speaking about the ishara, the indicating with the finger, he said, لَهِيَ أَشَدُّ عَلَى الشَّيْطَانِ مِنَ الْحَدِيدِ it, is, it causes greater injury, meaning this indicating with the finger, it causes greater injury to shaitan than iron does. And Mulla Ali Khari, he comments on this hadith and he says, إِذْ أَنَّهُ يَتَأَثَّرُ إِذْ أَنَّهُ لَا يَتَأَثَّرُ بِالْحَدِيدِ مَا يَتَأَثَّرُ بِالْتَوْحِيدِ He said, it's not iron that causes injury to shaitan. It is tawheed that causes injury to shaitan. He's saying what the hadith is saying is that shaitan is not affected by things that affect you and I. 
what affects him is the sentimental meaning, the value that is implicit in this indication, which is Tawheed. That's what bothers him so much. It is more damaging and causes greater injury to shaitan than iron does. So this is something about the raising of the finger. And here our Prophet ﷺ taught us to say the tashahud. Where you say, At-tahiyyatu lillahi, let's take it sentence by sentence. At-tahiyyatu lillahi. All royal greetings belong to Allah. That's what you're saying in your tashahud. And a lot of you, I believe, will be hearing this for the first time. Alhamdulillah, we are here to understand and learn. But it is key to unlock these meanings of something we do tens of times a day. And for years of our life. You say, At-tahiyyatu lillahi. All royal greetings belong to Allah. This is one of five understandings, by the way. Five, one of five translations. But we will stick with this one for simplicity. It will suffice. At-tahiyyatu, plural, of tahiyya, a royal greeting. What you are saying here is, every royal greeting that is offered to a government, or a prince, a sultan, an amir, a king, queen, whether in the UK or in Japan, an emperor, whoever he or she may be, all of these expressions of royal greeting and honor, ta'aleem, they all belong to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthier of them all. And this is one of the meanings of tahiyya here, ta'aleem, the glorification, the titles of glory that are given to people or things. Allah Almighty is the worthiest of them all. You may offer a statement of Amir and Sultan and so on and so on. But in reality, they are nothing in the eyes of Allah. Who is the one who deserves these descriptions? And they befit him. And he is a greater description as well. That is Allah. So you say, At-tahiyyatu lillah. All royal greetings belong to Allah. Then you say, Was-salawatu. And all prayers, they belong to Allah. wa tayyibat And all pure speech and actions, they belong to Allah. At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. Now that you have finished praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you turn to the individual who has the greatest right upon you in the life of this world after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you give him a nasib, a share of your dua. You now say, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. O oh Allah, give peace and security to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and mercy and blessing. When you say, As-salamu alayk, you are saying, O oh Allah, give him security, give him safety, free him from all harm, free him from all evil, save him, give him security, along with his message, his religion, save it from all harm after his death. And it is not something strange that we should remember the Prophet ﷺ in a daily dua whilst he was the man who never forgot us in his dua. How many times did it happen when he was reduced to tears thinking about the welfare of Muslims and longing to meet those Muslims whom he had never met, those who come after him. When he would go to the graveyards and he would say, I wish that I had the opportunity to meet my brothers. And the companions would say, are, are we not your brothers? He said to them, you're my friends. He said, my brothers are those who come after me. And they believe in me, though they have never seen me. So he thought about you. He prayed for you. In fact, he wept for you. In the famous occasion when Angel Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ, because he's crying in the middle of the night. And Jibreel, he says to him, Allah is asking you, and Allah knows best. Why he is crying. Allah asks you, why are you weeping? And he says, Ummati ya Jibreel, Ummati. I'm worried about my nation. I worry about my nation. And Allah Almighty instructs Jibreel to tell the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, Inna sanurdika fi ummatika wa la nasuk. We're going to make you happy with respect to your ummah and we're not going to let you down. Allahu Akbar. So the thought of you, my brother, Ya Ahmed, Ya Ali, Ya Khalid, so-and-so, sister, Sumayya, Fatima, the thought of your welfare reduced him to tears. And every prophet and messenger had a dua that Allah Almighty gave him to make in the life of this world that would definitely be answered. And all of the prophets and messengers used that dua for a noble cause in the life of this world. 
with the exception to our Prophet. He said, I'm going to save this answered dua for the Day of Judgment to benefit my Ummah. So is it too much to remember him in a daily dua? Allahu Akbar alayhi salatu wasalam, he is deserving. So you, after praising Allah, you turn to him. And you say, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace be upon Allah, may the peace be upon the Messenger of Allah and the mercy of Allah and blessings. Then when you finish with this, and by the way, I wish to say something here. No doubt that each and every one of us wishes that he or she had the opportunity to offer this greeting, this salam and dua directly to the blessed face of the Prophet Is that not the case? Wouldn't it have been infinitely more satisfying to see his blessed face, to enjoy his charming smile and to serve him, to carry the burdens of him, and to kiss his hands and his forehead, and to wipe away the soil from his blessed feet, and to say to him, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi, peace and blessings be upon you, O Messenger of Allah, to do it in person. Yeah, we would have loved that. But we have been deprived of this opportunity in the life of this world for the wisdom of Allah, things that he knows that we don't. So since that we have missed out on this opportunity, let's not miss out on the second best opportunity, which is to give him salam through this dua that I have just shared with you. And rest assured, there is a promise for people who do this. The hadith which Abu Dawood narrates that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يُسَلِّمُ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا رَدَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ رُوحِي حَتَّى أَرُدَّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Any person who makes dua for salam to me, Allah restores my soul to my body so that I may re respond in kind. So that I may respond in kind and make dua for him. By name. So you may doubt the outcome of your dua for one barrier or another, one reason or another, but you cannot doubt the dua of the Prophet So always say, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. He will give a personalized response, Allah will give him permission. So you've missed out on the face-to-face -face salam, don't miss out on the second best opportunity. Then when you have praised Allah and you have given salam upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what's left? What's left is yourself and your brothers and sisters around you. So you conclude the dua by saying, As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. May peace be upon us and upon the righteous slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have a right upon you too. And then you conclude by saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And I testify that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger. And that's the conclusion of your tahiyyat. Then, when you have concluded this, and you have continued your salah, you now continue praying till you reach your final tashahud. This will be your second one in salatul Dhuhr or Asr or Maghrib or Isha, and it will be the same one if it is Fajr, it's only the one. When you get to your final tashahud, you recite what you just heard at Tahiyyat, and now there is a salah al-Ibrahimiyyah upon the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and upon Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. What will you say here? You will say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. O oh Allah, honor Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad and Honor the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. As you have honored Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim, innaka hamidun majid. You are praiseworthy and glorious. And then you say, Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. As you have blessed Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim, innaka hamidun majid. You are praiseworthy and glorious. Question here. Why is it that you are making a dua for Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? Of all the Prophets, why him? Side by side with our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. The dua could have been, Allahumma salli, or kama sallayta ala Dawood, wa ala ali Dawood, innaka hamidun majid. Or kama sallayta ala Sulaiman, wa ali Sulaiman, innaka hamidun majid. Why Ibrahim? One of the reasons is that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, as you said, uh, rather care about that, he is... Khalilullah, he is the close friend of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Such that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said shortly before he died that if I had taken a Khalil, a close friend from my Ummah, it would have been Abu Bakr. 
But Allah has taken me as a Khalil, as He has taken Ibrahim as a Khalil. So the greatest human being to come into existence after our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he is Ibrahim. And it is his religion that Allah Almighty instructed us to follow, the religion of al Hanifiyyah, Al-Ibrahimiyyah, the upright monotheistic way of Prophet Ibrahim. So it is apt that we include his name side by side with the name of the Prophet وسلم, in the salawat. Another reason, this was mentioned by uh, Badruddin, Al-Aini, one of the Hanafi scholars, he gives another two reasons. He said, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was taken into the Mi'raj journey, taken into the heavens, and he met all of the Prophets and Messengers, and he spoke with them, the only Prophet who made a special request to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he should give his greetings on his behalf to us was Prophet Ibrahim. Prophet Ibrahim, he said to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, convey my salams to your ummah. He's the only one who did that. So in a similar kind, we respond to this favor by remembering him as he remembered us in the heavens. We remember him here on the earth in a dua in every single one of our salah, subhanallah. Hal jaza'ul ihsani illa al-ihsan, Allah said. Excellence should be rewarded with excellence. A second reason which the Shaykh mentions is that when Ibrahim والسلام, concluded his building of the Kaaba, he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, Oh Allah, any person from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who comes to this masjid to pray, convey my salam to him on behalf of me and on behalf of my family. So we respond in a similar kind by remembering him in a dua. And we send salutations upon our Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet of Allah Ibrahim ﷺ. When you have finished this, you are now in a strong position to make dua. This is one of the most likely times and places of all that dua will be accepted. Just before you conclude your salah. And that is why At-Tirmidhi narrates in his jamia. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked the question, Ayyu du'a'i asma'? Which du'a is most likely to be answered? He said, Jawfa al-layl al-akhir wa dubura salawati al-maktubat. He said the most likely time and place where du'a is answered is in the latter hours of the night and at the end of each one of the obligatory salah. The latter parts of the night and in the concluding parts of every salah. You finish your salah upon the Prophet وسلم, and upon Ibrahim وسلم, there is now an opportunity to make dua. And it makes sense that this is a place for dua, doesn't it? I want you to imagine that you are now sharing a space with someone who is dear to you and you engage in warm conversation together and you connect and you bond. And there is a sense of familiarity, huh? and friendliness, and understanding, and joy. When you finish that conversation, what do we usually say to this person just before we love them and leave them? We say, what do we say? Is there anything you need? Is there anything I can do for you? Can I assist you, help you in any way? Let me know. And similarly here in Salah, you have spent a few minutes glorifying your Lord, bonding with Him, glorifying Him, praising Him. Do you think this will go without gratitude from Allah as shakur So it's almost as if you are being told, now that the Salah, you are bidding it farewell, your Lord wishes to say to you, is there anything I can do for you? Just before you go, just before you conclude with Salam, is there anything you need from this world or the hereafter? Ask, what can I do for you? So now there is the space or the opportunity for dua. And our Messenger وسلم, in this position, he would make abundant dua. And some of the dua he would say was as follows. Memorize some of these if you can or look them up. Muslim narrates on the authority of Abu Hurairah that the Prophet وسلم, encouraged us to say at the end of each prayer the following words. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of hell. 
وَمِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ and from the punishment of the grave وَمِنْ فِتْنَةِ الْمَحْيَا وَالْمَمَاتِ and from the tests of this life and the hereafter death وَمِنْ شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحِ الدَّجَّالِ and I seek refuge in you from the evil fitna trials of Al-Masih al-Dajjal, the Antichrist. In every one of your salah, this should be included before you, before you conclude your salah. Another dua we are recommended to make as Bukhari narrates, and this dua was taught by the Prophet ﷺ to the greatest of this ummah after its Prophet Abu Bakr. He said to him, you should say the following words. اللهم إني ظلمت نفسي ظلما كثيرا. Oh Allah, I have wronged myself an abundant wronging. ولا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت. Nobody can forgive sins but you. فاغفر لي مغفرة من عندك. So give me a forgiveness that is from you. وارحمني. Have mercy upon me. إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم. You are the forgiving and merciful. And a third dua. This is another beautiful one. سبحان الله. Which an Nasai narrates. That the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa would say the following words. Ya Allah. He would say, Allahumma bi'ilmi kal ghayb. O Allah, I ask you by your knowledge of the unseen. Wa qudratika ala al khalq. And I ask you by your ability over creation. Ahini ma alimta al hayata khayran li. Give me life so long as you know that life is good for me. Wa tawafani idha alimta al wafata khayran li. But cause me to die if you know that death is better for me. وأسألك اللهم خشيتك في الغيب والشهادة. أنا أسألك يا الله for fear of you in the public and private matters. وأسألك كلمة الحق في الرضا والغضب. أنا أسألك you to inspire me to speak the truth when I am content and when I am angry. وأسألك القصد في الفقر والغناء. أنا أسألك you for moderation during times of poverty and affluence. وأسألك نعيم لا ينفد. أنا أسألك you for a delight that never ends. وأسألك قرة عين لا تنقطع. And I ask you for a joy that persists. وأسألك الرضا بعد القضاء. And I ask you to give me contentment with all of your decrees. وأسألك برد العيش بعد الموت. And I ask you for the coolness of life after death. وأسألك لذة النظر إلى وجهك. And I ask you for the sweetness of looking at your face. والشوق إلى لقائك. And I ask you for the longing to meet you. في غير ضراء مضرة ولا فتنة مضلة. A longing to meet you, O oh Allah, that is not caused by pain or misguiding fitna that causes me to wish for death. اللهم زينا بزينة الإيمان. O Allah, decorate us with the beauty, the adornment of faith. وجعلنا هداة مهتدين. And make us people who are guided and guiding to others. What a dua. لا إله إلا الله. And what a way to conclude your salah. Commit this to memory, dear brothers and sisters, as one of your missions before the end of this week, inshallah. So now that you have concluded your dua, you're now going to finish your salah. And the way that you finish your salah, of course, is by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, turning to your right, and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, turning to your left. This is one of the formats of ending your prayer. And here, your intention should be several things. The first is that you are giving salam greeting to those angels who have been part of your life since the day you were born. Since the day you came into existence, there were two angels from many who were appointed, one to your right, documenting your good deeds within a book, and one to your left, documenting your every sin within a book. Today, they are unseen on the day of judgment when they put those books together, they will present them to you. You will read your life script that you had been authoring today and you will meet those angels for the first time in your life and you will put name to face, and face to name. So they have a right to be greeted. They're part of your journey in this world and part of your journey in the hereafter till we, you and I arrive at paradise or hell, God forbid. So you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. But you are also giving salam and greeting to your brothers and sisters who are around you. Because they have a right. For the duration of the salah, you had ascended to enormous heights. You had disconnected from the life of this world. And you were communicating with Al-Malik Al-Rahman, the King Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now is the time to transition back to reality. 
to transition back to dunya and to recognize that there are brothers around you, sisters around you, my sister, who have been sharing this sacred space with you. So you say, Assalamu alaikum, greeting them all to reaffirm your bond, reaffirm your brotherhood and sisterhood, to acknowledge them. And therefore, it doesn't make sense that you say, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, you are making dua that Allah should give them peace, but then in your heart, you're still harboring a fallout with him or her. In the same masjid, brothers saying, Salaamu Alaikum, Salaamu Alaikum, but they're not talking to one another. It doesn't make sense. It's a paradox, an oxymoron. They don't fit with one another. So when you say, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, beware of hypocrisy, Akhi. Beware of being two-faced in this. Say it from the depths of your heart. You mean it. 